We are in Fate and Destiny, Rav Soloveitchik, and we're on page 25, and we're talking about, in, in um, he's using, as we know, he's using uh, Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs, as his way of writing his book. So at this point, he's talking about, he says that the, uh, the person knocked, the, the lover knocked six knocks. So he's looking at those six knocks, and he's going to examine what these six knocks are about. He says, eight years ago, in the midst of the night of terror, filled with horrors of Maidenik, Treblinka, and Buchenwald, in the night of gas chambers and crematoria, in the night of absolute divine self-concealment, what we call Hester Ponim Muchlat. Muchlat is uh, decisively covering God's face. And uh, whenever we don't see open miracles, we call that Hester upon him, that Hashem is hiding his face and we, uh, becoming the, uh, the man behind the curtain, if you will. Okay? We don't see God, but and it's, it's, uh, that's what he's saying, absolute divine self-concealment. In a night ruled by the Satan of doubt and apostasy, which sought to sweep the maiden from her house into the Christian church, in a, in a night of continuous searching, of bequesting for the beloved, in that very night the beloved appeared. Now, when, Sol when Rev. Soloveitchik is talking like this, he's uh, giving a lot of inferences that you really have to be aware of what was going on. During the Holocaust, many of the Jews, well, they would give their children to the, uh, to, to the church to protect their children. They thought that that was better than going to the uh, the camps because at least the child hiding them there. Hidden children. There's a whole thing about the hidden children. Right. So what happened was it, it was an understanding that the church would not convert these kids. What they would do is just hide them, and then when they, if and when the parents would come back or the war would end, these kids would then be uh, brought back to the Jewish community. It's, it's well documented that many of them were not, that many of them were uh, converted. And that's what he's saying, that they, in this moment of doubt, this moment, it was years, but in, in history, it's a moment of doubt, and they were sweeping them into the Christian church. So he's very negative about that, as we all would be. And then he continues, says, God who conceals himself in his dazzling hiddenness suddenly manifested himself and began to knock at the tent of his despondent and disconsolate love, twisting convulsively on her bed, suffering the pains of hell. As a result of the knocks on the door of the maiden, wrapped in mourning, the state of Israel was born. Remember, this is what he's fighting for. He wants, he's talking to us to try to get us involved in Israel. But watch what he does with this. It's amazing. He it says, How many times did the beloved knock on the door of the tent of his love? It appears to me that we can count at least six knocks. First, the knock of the beloved was heard on, in the political arena. No one can deny that from the standpoint of international relations, the establishment of the state of Israel in a political sense was an almost supernatural occurrence. Both Russia and the Western countries jointly supported the idea of the establishment of the state. This was perhaps the only proposal where East and West were united. I am inclined, and this is, everybody will like this, those who love the United Nations will love what he's about to say. I am inclined to believe the United Nations organization was created specifically for this purpose, in order to carry out the mission which divine providence has set for it. It seems to me that one cannot point to any other concrete achievement on the part of the UN. Now, he was not living, he was saying this in the, I think the 60s or the 50s, whatever it was. Uh, but it's, uh, <laughs> it hasn't changed. People still pick on the UN for that. They haven't done anything. So he's saying their whole purpose was for that one second. Our sages of blessed memory already expressed the view that at times rain descends for a single person. 
or for a single blade of grass. I do not know whom the journalists with eyes of flesh and blood saw sitting in the chairman's seat during that faith, faith, uh, faith, uh, fateful session when the General Assembly decided in favor of the establishment of the state. However, someone who at that time observed matters well with his spiritual eye could have sensed the presence of the true chairman who proceeded over the discussion, the beloved. So he's talking about God was there. It was only through God that the state of Israel could have been established. I mean, think of the odds that were against it. You're after the war, fine. People, you're in, uh, you're in 48. The, the war has ended two, two years, be, uh, wait, 45, the war ended, correct? War ends in 45. They have, th so the world, if you look at what happens now, three years is a tremendously long time in a political life. You forget everything. And net yet, three years later, when all of the hurt, if you will, of the Jews would have been forgotten, who cares about Jews being killed? And yet three years later, suddenly, everybody's agreeing, except for the Arab countries, to give a, to make Israel a, a the Jewish state. So it's an amazing thing. It was he who knocked with his gavel on the podium. Do not inter interpret the verse. That night, the sleep of the king fled, which was from Esther, as referring to the sleep... I'm sorry. Do we not interpret the, the verse? That night, the sleep of the king fled, as referring to the sleep of the king of the universe? Where Ahasuerus Rosh Hashanah could not sleep, it would have been of no consequence. And the salvation of Israel would not have blossomed forth on that night. That's and if you uh, remember when you heard the Megillah, when it says we sing it out, so it's when it says that the uh, king could not sleep. So said when you say the king's uh, the word of the king, go Hamelach. That's a traditional way to do that, which is a Rosh Hashanah tune in the middle of the Megillah. So it's, it's a very interesting thing. And that's what the, the rabbis are saying. The reason we do that is because when it says the sleep of the king of, uh, was fled, it was referring to God. It's referring to God at that point, And that's what he's bring, bringing out here. Uh, however, if it is a king of the universe who, as it were, does not slumber, then the redemption will be born. If it had been John Doe who called the session of the United States to order, the state of Israel would have never come into being. But if the beloved knocked on the ch chairman's podium, then the miracle occurred. It was, it is the voice of my beloved that knocketh. Fine, that's number one. That's the first knock that we had the state of Israel reestablished. Second, the knocking of the beloved could be heard on the battlefield. The small Israeli defense forces defeated the mighty armies of the Arab countries. The miracle of the many in the hands of the few took place before our very eyes. And an even greater miracle occurred at that time. God hardened the heart of Ishmael, the, the Arabs, and enjoined him to do battle against the state of Israel. You know what he's saying is, this is an amazing statement. He, God is hardening their heart so that they will do battle against us. And he's going to tell you why. Had the Arabs not declared war against the state and instead agreed to the partition plan, the state of Israel would have lacked Jerusalem, a large part of the Galilee, and several areas of the Negev. Anybody who looks at the partition plan, you know that there, uh, there is, there's a lot of breaks in what the land of Israel was, was supposed to be. And the Arab countries were in the middle. I'm talking about gerrymandering, uh, borders here. It was really a cut up. There was no, it was not one contiguous state. It was very broken up. And he's saying, if the Arabs would have said, Amen, brother, we would have lost, uh, we would have accepted it all. No question, we would have accepted it, but we wouldn't have a lot of our country. Then he says, had Pharaoh thousands of years ago allowed the Israelites to depart from Egypt immediately in accordance with Moses' original request, Moses would have been bound to keep his promise and would have had to return after three days. So here's another thing. God has to harden his heart. His heart. He has to make him think, hey, it's no good. 
free will or not. We're not going to deal with free will or not. That's from the speech. But it's he's making a strong point here that if they would, if the Pharaoh would have given him right away, like we say he should have, well, then Moses would have had to return after three days. However, Pharaoh hardened his heart and did not hearken, did not hearken or listen to Moshe. The Almighty took the Israelites out of Egypt with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm. Consequently, Moshe's pledge that they would return to Egypt was no longer binding. A bilateral, a bilateral contract cannot bind one party if the other party refuses to fulfill his, his obligations. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh. Okay, that's number two. So we have the first one again, State of Israel. Second one is the Israeli Defense Force beating the Arabs. Uh, and let's face it, that itself was a miracle. There's no way they should have been in 48. Uh, this should be, logically, they should have been destroyed. Third, the beloved, the beloved began to knock as well on the door of the theological tent. And it may very well have been that this was the strongest knock of all. I have often emphasized when speaking of the land of Israel that all the claims of the Christian theologians that God deprived the Jewish people of its rights in the land of Israel and that all the biblical promises regarding Zion and Jerusalem refer in an allegorical sense to Christianity and the Christian church and that has been publicly refuted by the establishment of the state of Israel and has been exposed as falsehood, lacking all validity. According to the Christian church, the, uh, the, uh, the Pope and everybody else, every, they said, as long as we don't accept Jesus, then we will be wandering Jews forever and we, we're damned to do that. That's it. So now, when uh, what Shalavetchik is saying is, once Israel was established, reestablished as a Jewish state, it proved retroactively that whole claim to be false. It never should have happened, which is why, incidentally, to this very day, the church does not recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Theologically, they cannot do that. It's, it's not. And as a result, the United States does not recognize Jerusalem as the capital. It's an amazing thing. Our, our, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, the consulate? Consulate. Our consulate is in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. okay. Amazing thing. But that's what he's saying. He, he proved it wrong. It requires a comprehensive knowledge of Christian theological literature from Justin Martyr down to contemporary theologians to properly appreciate the great miracle which so clearly invalidated the central premise of Christian theology. We ought to take note of the quote-unquote learned explanation of our Secretary of State, Mr. John Foster Dulles, that was with uh, Eisenhower, who also serves as an elder in the Episcopal Church at a meeting of the Senate Committee that the Arabs hate the Jews because the Jews killed the founder of their religion. That's what he said. Now, we all know that we didn't kill Muhammad. <clears throat> that's, that's the bottom line. Muhammad didn't die. I mean, he, he wasn't killed. He died a natural death, as far as I remember. Am I correct? He died, it's a natural death he died. I don't think he died even in war. I think he just died naturally. But this guy who was Episcopal said, no, the reason the Arabs hate the Jews is because they killed their founder. Okay. So the, this explanation, quote-unquote explanation, possesses profound hidden sub, uh, symbolic significance. I'm not a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and certainly not a psychoanalyst. However, I do have some acquaintance with the Talmud, and I remember well what our sages said about Bil'am. When Bil'am was hired by Balak to curse the Jewish people, he only came out with blessings. And so the rabbis say, from his blessing... You learn what was in his heart. As he blessed us beautifully, he wanted to do the exact opposite. So when a person speaks at length, the truth may at times slip out. When one of the senators asked the Secretary of State why the Arabs hate the Jews, he really wanted to reply, I myself, as a Christian, don't bear any great love for them. 
for they killed our Messiah and as a result lost their share in the inheritance of Abraham. However, if an angel intervened or, uh, or a bit was placed in the secretary's mouth as happened to Bilam, according to the sages' interpretation of the verse, and he put a word in his mouth, and instead of uttering the words, our Messiah and I myself, alternative terms slipped out of his mouth, and he said, the Arabs and Muhammad. In his subconscious, he is afraid of the terrible fact that the Jewish people rule over Zion and Jerusalem. I find special pleasure in reading articles about the state of Israel in Catholic and Protestant newspapers. Against their will, they have to use the name Israel when they report the news about Zion and Jerusalem, which are now in our hands. I always derive a particular sense of satisfaction from reading in a newspaper that the response of the state of Israel is not yet known since today is the Sabbath and the offices of the ministries are closed. Or from reading a news release from the United uh, Press on Passover Eve that the Jews will sit down tonight at a Seder table confident that the miracles of Egypt will recur today. It is the voice of my beloved at Nachus. Think about where he's coming from. Today, we wouldn't think twice about this. Everybody, Israel is on, the, on everybody's lips. We're, <clears throat> Judaism, we're, we're very Jewish. We can do what we want. We take, day, we take Shabbos off. We have all these things set up in law that if I say I'm a Shabbos observant person that you have to work around my work schedule. We wear a kippah outside where we have kosher. It's so, it's so easy to get kosher today. It's not, it's not even funny how easy it is. And what happened in his day, it wasn't easy. Remember where he's coming from. It wasn't easy. You had to, in his day when he was growing up, you didn't wear a kippah outside. You wear, wear a hat, or a baseball hat, that's how they used to walk around. Certainly, you're not going to wear your sitsis outside. It, was, it wasn't a smart thing to do, to be killed for being Jewish. And people were beaten up for, be, for being Jewish. Just for being Jewish. Never mind doing anything that was Jewish. They were being beaten up. And here, <clears throat> to, to listen to reports saying they, we can't get uh, information because they're closed for the Sabbath, while wow. Jewish pride rose tremendously when Israel became a state and, f and they beat back the enemy in 48, 49, 56, <clears throat> and certainly in 67, we were at the top of the world. Jews, wherever they were, unless he's going to pick on, we're at the top of the world. We had pride again. We we're willing to wear our Jewish stars out. We we're willing to wear a kippah on our head. We we're willing to say we're kosher. We we're willing to do a lot of things at that point. Fourth, the beloved, but I'm saying you have to remember where he's coming from to really appreciate this sort of thing. Fourth, the beloved is knocking in the hearts of the perplexed and assimilated youths. The era of self-concealment, this Hastara Panim, at the beginning of the 1940s resulted in great confusion among the Jewish masses, and in particular among the Jewish youth. Assimilation grew and became more rampant. The impulse to flee from, uh, from Judaism and from the Jewish people reached a new height. They call that, if I remember correctly, the lost generation. So I think that's what they were called. Fear, despair, and sheer ignorance caused many to spurn the Jewish community and to board the ship. Look, watch, look, see what he does here. To flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He's quoting... Uh, a line from Jonah, from the book of Jonah, where it says that Jonah was supposed to give a prophecy to the Bnei Israel. Uh, I'm sorry, to um, to uh, Nineveh, who were non-Jews, to tell them to repent. And he said, "No, I can't do it." And he runs away, he goes on the ship. Well, it doesn't work out for him that well. But nonetheless, he was saying that I have to leave uh, from the presence of the Lord. I'm going to walk out. So he's using that imagery to say that these Jews who were confused, confounded, if God is really here, how could he allow the Holocaust to happen? How could he allow all this anti-Semitism? Therefore, I'm going to run away. I don't want to be part of this anymore. 
They want to flee. A raging, seemingly uncontrollable torrent threatened to destroy us. It's called Nazism. Suddenly, and oh, but by the way, this is saying something too. When, when Germany was running rampant and killing the Jews, nobody, for the most part, was speaking up. You had some, some voices out there, but very, very few, and they were really uh, put down. I just heard, uh, I don't know when this happened, but apparently Christians were killed uh, recently, recently by... Oh, in Egypt? Or in Libya? Uh, by ISIS, by ISIS. Okay, and what happened? So uh, the only reason I heard it is because my wife's listening to uh, Glenn Beck, but behind the times. So I'm not sure where he is yet. And he's, he, so he said, and the Pope came out and condemned it. It's a Christian Holocaust. If you read this stuff, uh, first of all, okay, I'm not going to get involved in, in the language that they're going to use. But I was thinking, well, of course the Pope is going to come out. This is when he has to shine. This is his people that he's talking about. When it came to the Jewish Holocaust, the Pope didn't speak up. The Pope was deadly silent. The church, no, 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 I take that back. They weren't silent. They were saying, good for you. If you, there's a book called The Moral Reckoning that details what the church did and what they could have done and what they actually did do. And they were guilty. They're horribly guilty for the death that they allowed because they didn't speak up. So now that he's speaking up, it's no big wonder. I'm not sure why everybody's amazed that the Pope would speak up as Christians who are being killed. Call it what you want. I mean, it's wrong. I'm not saying that. But it's, uh, I don't know how they got from 52 to be a mass, uh, to be a Holocaust, but okay. A Holocaust is, uh, it's 52 people who I think they were killed. 21. 21 people. They called it a Holocaust. I was thinking, you're just throwing these words around at this point to throw 21. Uh, it's, again, it's, it's sad, it's wrong. I have no problem to, to condemn them for it, but you don't call it a Holocaust. It's a special name already. But nonetheless, that's what's going on. So, uh, so here, that's what I'm saying. The people were very confu uh, confused. So suddenly, the beloved began to knock on the doors of the hearts of the perplexed. And his knock, the rise of the state of Israel, at the very least, slowed the process of flight. Many of those who in the past were alienated, who were, uh, who in the past were alienated from the Jewish people, are now tied to the Jewish state by a sense of pride in this outstanding achievements. Many American Jews who have been semi, demi, or, hem, or hemi assimilated. I had to look up each word, and they helped me the same thing. Half, half, half. Okay, so I don't know why he had to say that. It was just, you know, okay. Are now filled with fear and concern about the crisis overtaking the state of, the state of Israel, and they pray for its security and welfare, even though they're still far from being completely committed to it. Even those who are opposed to the state of Israel, and there are such Jews, are compelled to defend themselves without let up against the strange charge of dual loyalty. And they loudly proclaim day in and day out that they have no share in the Holy Land. It is good for a Jew not to be able to hide from his Jewishness, but to be compelled to keep answering the question, who are you? And that is a div and what is your divine? Uh, what is your uh, occupation? Again, this is going to Yonah, where even if overcome by cowardice, he lacks the strength and courage to answer proudly, "I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven," which is what Jonah a answered to the uh, ship's captain. This persistent question, "Who are you?" binds him to the Jewish people. The very fact that people are always talking about Israel serves to remind the Jew in flight that he cannot run away from the Jewish community with which he has been entwined, intertwined from birth. So he's looking at Israel in two ways. One, Israel is the best thing since sliced bread because it's an open miracle and it brings us all back. It's showing that God's very much in our midst. On the other hand, it also and it shows the Christians you're wrong what you're saying. And Baruch Hashem, we've finally been vindicated. After thousands of years of you persecuting us, we're now vindicated to show you that you're all wrong. But then he says, and even the better part, is all you assimilated Jews out there, you were running and running and running, 
And now you have to defend yourself the other way to say, no, I, I, I don't hold by the land of Israel. Something like that. You're, you, they're chasing you. They're chasing you with your identity. You can't hide it anymore. It's not because you're wearing a star or anything else. This is a moment of pride. And even though you want to run away from it, you can't. So it's interesting. He's attacking everybody on this one. Wherever we turn, we encounter the world. Is we encounter the word Israel? Wherever, whether we listen to the radio, read the newspaper, participate in symposia about current affairs, we find the question of Israel always public, being publicly discussed. And the crazy thing is, again, I forget when he wrote this, but it hasn't changed. 2014, 15, we're still doing this. This fact. Uh, is of particular importance for Jews who are afflicted with self-hatred and wish to escape from Judaism and flee for their lives. They, like Yonah, seek to hide in the innermost part of the ship and wish to slumber, but the shipmaster does not allow them to ignore their fate. The shadow of Israel pursues them unceasingly, buried, hidden in, th uh, buried, hidden thoughts and paradoxical reflections emerge from the depths of the soul of even the most avowed assimilationists. And once a Jew begins to think and contemplate, once his sleep is disturbed, who knows where his thoughts will take him, what form of expression his doubts and queries will assume. It's the voice of my beloved that knocketh. <laughs> That's, he's only a rabbi can pull this off. Okay. The fifth knock of the, bless, of the beloved is perhaps the most important of all. For the first time in the history of our exile, divine providence has surprised our enemies with the sensational discovery that Jewish blood is not free for the taking. It is not Hefker, it is not ownerless. If anti-Semites wish to describe this phenomenon as an eye for an eye, so be it. We will agree with them. If we wish to heroically defend our national historical existence, we must at times interpret the verse, an eye for an eye in Exodus, literally. How many eyes did we lose, did we lose during the course of our bitter exile because we did not return blow for blow? By the way, if uh, uh, Meir Kahan, if he was alive, uh, he, or he, was, he knew the Rav, he was in Rav Shir, I think he actually learned by the Rav for some time, but this is, was his philosophy too. Defend. It's time to defend. Jewish Defense League. Okay. But again, watch what he does. It's interesting because here's a, here's a man who is very halachic. I mean, he wrote a book, Halachic Man. And he, he sees the, the world through the eyes of the Torah. And through the and he's going to get this. The old tradition, they're all integrally tied. We have been... And, for him to suddenly say, oh, so let's take it literally for a second. Watch me. Like I said, it's interesting because you would say, ah, how can you do that? We always fought against that. We, for years, if centuries, have fought against this. So he's going to explain. He said, the time has come for us to fulfill an eye for an eye in its, uh, yeah, in its, in its plain, simple sense. I am certain that everyone who knows me knows that I am a believer of the oral law, in the oral law, and consequently, that I do not doubt that the verse refers to monetary compensation in accordance with the halachic interpretation. However, with regard to Nasser and the Mufti, or the Mufti, I would demand that we interpret the phrase an eye for an eye in a strictly literal sense, as referring to the removal of the concrete actual eye. Pay no attention to the fine phrases of the well-known Jewish assimilationists or the socialists who continue to adhere, adhere to their own, to their outworn ideologies and think that they are living in Bielostok, Minsk, or Brisk of 1905 and who publicly declaim that it is forbidden for Jews to take revenge on any time, at any time, any place, and under all circumstances. Vanity of vanities! Revenge is forbidden when it serves no purpose. However, if by taking revenge we raise ourselves up to the plane of self-defense, then it becomes an elementary right of man qua man to avenge the wrongs inflicted upon him. So again, he's not going out saying, let's, let's murder everybody. He's saying, for self-defense, 
we have to take care of ourselves. We can't just say, well, we're not going to get revenge. No, this is, you're defending yourself. You have to do it. The Torah has always taught us that a person is permitted indeed, that it is his sacred obligation to defend himself. The biblical law about the thief breaking into a house indicates that it is a firmly fixed halakhic principle that a person is permitted to defend not only his life, but also his property. If the thief who comes to steal the money of the householder is capable of murdering the householder if he does not accede to his demands, then the householder is permitted to rise up against the lawbreaker and kill him. It is not for naught that the Torah informs us that its two great heroes, Avram and Moshe, both took up arms in order to defend their brethren. As it says, and he, Abraham, uh, armed his trained men, and he, Moshe, smote the Egyptian. Such behavior does not contradict the principles of mercy and loving kindness. On the contrary, a passive attitude, renouncing self-defense, is likely, at times, to give rise to the worst types of cruelty. It says in the Torah, And I will get me honor through Pharaoh and through all of his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. God does not seek honor and fame. He wanted Pharaoh, Moshe's contemporary, to know that he would have to pay a high price for the decree, every son that is born you shall cast into the river. So it's not that I'm going to do this because I just want my fame and fortune, God's saying. I'm saying because you deserve it. You, you, you did things you shouldn't have done. That's all. So you have to be punished. And now, uh, and now as well, it is God's wish that the blood of Jewish children who were murdered while reciting the Shemona Esrei be avenged. When God smote Egypt, he wished thereby to demonstrate that Jewish blood always has claimants. Today also, it is necessary to convince not only the current Egyptian tyrant, but also the self-declared Saint Nehru, the British foreign uh, office, and the moralists, uh, in the United Nations, that Jewish blood is not only this. Therefore, how grotesque is the attempt to convince us that we ought to rely on the declaration of these three great powers uh, guaranteeing the status quo. We all know from experience how much value there is to the promises of the British Foreign Office and to the quote-unquote friendship of certain well-known officials in our State Department. I'm not sure who he's referring to there when he's saying that, but... Uh, we can, uh, if you do your research, I'm sure you can figure that out. <clears throat> and in general, how absurd it is to demand of a people that it be completely dependent upon the good graces of others and that it relinquish the ability to defend itself. Now, again, this, can, uh, this happens so many times. It happened in, after all the wars and even as late as, well, this last war, <laughs> where, uh, where the United States is saying, back off but it was uh in not also in the saddam hussein when they when they were threatening with the uh, not scots what was he threatening with 90 in the 90s 91 it was th there was a big threat the gas to uh saddam hussein and i think it was bush who was bush president was scots that was scots that, that was bush was the president i believe yeah. Yeah, and Bush said, don't fight back. For all that we want to pick on Obama, the Republican also told us, don't fight back. It's worse now. Sorry? It's just worse now. Okay, I'm just saying, for everyone who wants to complain, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. we have to remember yeah. that every one of our presidents have told us, stand down. Yeah. You can't do this. And that's what he's saying. You can't rely upon these people. The honor... Uh, Right. So the honor of every community, like the honor of every individual, resides in the ability to defend its honor and ex its existence and honor. A people that cannot ensure its own freedom and security is not truly independent. The third phrase in God's promise of redemption is, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Blessed be he who has granted us life and brought us to this era where Jews have the power with the help of God, 
to defend themselves. Let us not forget the venom of Hitlerian Hitler, 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 anti-Semitism, which made the Jews like the fish of the sea to be preyed upon by all, still infects many in our generation who viewed this the horrific spectacle of the gassing of millions with indifference as an ordinary event not requiring a moment's thought. The antidote to this deadly poison that envenomed minds and benumbed hearts is the readiness of the state of Israel to defend the lives of its sons, its builders. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh. And finally, the last one, the sixth knock, which we must not ignore, was heard when the gates of the land were opened. A Jew who flees from a hostile country knows now knows that he can find secure refuge in the land of his ancestors. This is a new phenomenon in our history. Until now, whenever Jewish communities were expelled from their lands, they had to wander in the wilderness of the nations and were not able to find shelter in another land. Because the gates were barred before exiles and wanderers, many Jewish communities were decimated. Now the situation has changed. If a particular people expels the Jewish minority from its midst, the exiles can direct their steps into Zion, and she, like a compassionate mother, will gather in her children. We have all been witness to the Oriental Jew Jewry settling in the land of Israel in the past few years. Who knows what might have befallen our brethren in the lands in which they had settled, had not the land of Israel brought them by boats and planes uh, to her. Had the state of Israel arisen before Hitler's Holocaust, hundreds of thousands of Jews might have been saved from the gas chambers and crematoria. The miracle of the state came just a bit late. And as a result of this delay, thousands and tens of thousands of Jews were murdered. However, now the era of divine self-concealment that has upon him is over. Jews who have been uprooted from their homes can find lodging in the Holy Land. Let us not view this matter lightly. It is a view of my beloved that knocks. So now I'm going to ask you a question. Here we had it. He gave a beautiful uh, argument for Israel, what's going on. What if you were in the audience listening he's talking in america he's not talking in israel he's living in america what would you ask he's here too he's here he, he lived in he never he never went to israel i he, i'm not i mean he never moved to israel is that the old one you know why are we all here why are you here yeah not why are we here okay we're here because we're lazy okay but every single rabbi that makes a speech about Israel, 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 we have to go, we have to move. The congregation looks at that guy and says, you're the leader, show us the way. Get up and go, leave America, leave me alone already. Otherwise, don't bother me. Okay, so now he's talking about this and he's yelling, well, not yelling, but he, he is trying to get across that God is knocking. This is a tremendous time in history. It's, and so, you know, it's, Wake up, Jews! Wake up, you assimilated Jews! Wake up, everybody, right? Now, watch what he says. Okay. Because <laughs> that should be the reaction. So he starts, we're not going to get through the whole thing, but we can start it. The obligation of Torah Jewry in the land, to, to the Torah Jewry, the Orthodox, and the, to the land of Israel. What was our reaction to the voice of the beloved that knocks? to God's bount bounteous kindnesses and wonders. Did we descend from our cultures and immediately open the door? Or did we, like the Shulamite maiden, con continue to rest and tarry rather than descend from our beds? She said, I have to put on my coat. How shall I put... I I'm sorry. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I soil them? I'm comfortable here. I like America. <laughs> what do you want from me? All the trepidation and concern for the geographical integrity of the state of Israel <clears throat> on the one hand, and all of our enemies' proposals that are designed to exact territorial concessions from the state of Israel 
all of the brazen demands of the Arabs for boundary changes, on the other hand, are all based on the one and only one fact. He's about to hit us all. The Jews have not colonized the Negev and have not set up hundreds of settlements there. Period. It's our fault. Were the Negev settled by tens of thousands of Jews, then not even Nasser would dream of the possibility of wresting it from the state of Israel. Desolation from time immemorial and dangerous political tra uh, tranquility. The Torah has already emphasized this truth. The, uh, it says, Thou may, may not consume them, the nations of Canaan, quickly, lest the beasts of the field increase upon you. The fact that Jews conquered the Negev does not suffice. The main thing is to settle it. So again, Meyer Kahan, Meyer, Meyer Kahan would be smiling <laughs> if we were listening to the, this advice. Maimonides, the great eagle, ruled that the first sanctification of the land wrought by Joshua was not permanent because it derived from military conquest, which was nullified by the invasion of the enemy, whose army was mighty and weapons many, who conquered the land and seized it from us. The second sanctification wrought by Ezra, which derived from taking possession of the land and settling it in accordance with the divine command, with the toil of one's hands and the sweat of one's brow, was not nullified. The holiness grounded in settling the land. Settling, plain and simple, remains in effect for its time and for eternity. We have been remiss, and our guilt is great. American Jewry could certainly have accelerated the process of colonization. But why should we search out the faults of others and seek to blame, place the blame on the shoulders of the secular Jews? Ah, because so, <laughs> that's easy. Let us examine our own flaws and confess our own sins. It is precisely Orthodox Jews, more than, any, than, more than all other American Jews, who bear the burden of guilt for the slow pace of conquest through taking possession. By the way, why is he blaming the Orthodox Jews? Why not everybody? Why are you picking on me? The Orthodox are effective. Effective? Effective. Why? They, that's what matters. <laughs> that's, they're, they're the ones that work. They're the ones that continue. They're the ones. Okay. Yeah, what else? Haven't assimilated. No. Okay. What else? They are uh, kind of more visible. No. Major thing. We believe it. We believe in the Torah. Do we? we believe the Torah is from God. Yes, as an Orthodox Jew, we believe the Torah is from God. Right. No. So as so since it's from so by not doing to make this. An Sorry? They're obligated to... Correct. To since we are... since we That's what he's picking on us for. Right. He's saying, wait a second. We believe this stuff. We don't think it was written by man over thousands of years. We don't think it was written by different schools of thought. We believe. We accept. We're mom and the Torah. We accept that the Torah came at Sinai, that God spoke these commandments to us. We believe it. They do not. They don't. When they don't go, they, the non-Orthodox, when they don't go, it's no big surprise. They may feel Jewish pride, they may, they're certainly Jews, but they don't have the same connection that we supposedly do. Again, he's setting us up. He's really making it come home, because it's so easy to blame the other guy. Say, if you would have just gone over, look what they would have done. And so they say to us, excuse me, you're the ones that care. You're the ones that claim you believe in all this stuff. It's like what Rush Limbaugh once said about why they always pick on Republicans. When a Republican has a scandal, they force him to uh, resign. When a, uh, when a uh, Democrat has a scandal, there's no talk of, des uh, of resigning. That people laugh it off. He said, what's the difference? He, he, and he said, because... We claim we have morals. They never claimed it. I don't think the Democrats really appreciate that statement, but nonetheless, they never claimed to be morals. We claim to be a moral family related, blah, 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 blah. He's saying, 
So therefore, we have to if something if if one of us goes off the deep end, they're going to attack us. They don't attack them because they don't claim that. So here, what he's doing is saying, I'm not going to attack the non-religious Jew who doesn't who's who never said I believe in Torah and have to do all these things. He's a living he's living his reality. He doesn't believe in it. On the other hand, we claim we do. And yet we're here. God gave us Eretz Israel. Why are we still here? And why, the question is, why didn't he leave after all this? I don't know. But with all this, he still didn't leave. He remained in America the rest of his life. I think that he was supposed to be the chief rat, but whatever, but it didn't work out. But it's uh, in the end, and I don't know why. I mean, I, I wasn't, I'm sure somebody speaks about it, somebody would ask, but I have no idea why. But from this conversation he's having with himself, yeah. So it's clear that he should have just run over. At least at this point. Maybe we'll find out by the end of the book why he decides it's not uh, the way to go. I don't know. Or we, but, don't, or we don't believe it. Oh, he's saying we do. He's taking as right. a, he's saying for granted that this is what we claim. Given we do. Given what we claim and this is what we say, then we should be uh, we should be doing this. Uh, and the truth is we're going to have to stop at that point. So we're stopping on Page 37 in the middle of his argument. <laughs>